Okay, so what, today I'm going to speak about something controversial. I'm going to call it a call to arms. And this is about technology not being utilized properly or not being leveraged to its full extent. It's very, very frustrating. And uh, someone said to me, because of my demeanor this morning, because of a late night last night, it's actually the reason I'm putting up this kill technology. But I actually fundamentally believe it. I think technology is being applied in a way in the world today incorrectly. Um, we are not leveraging the networks that is at our disposal, the feature sets and the capabilities. And today I want to do this to engineers, to hackers, and pretty much everyone out there are hackers today. It's a call to arms. Let's kill technology. So let's talk about the people that I'm referring to, hackers. There's a great book, you can get it, it's written by Stephen Levy, that goes into the background of what hackers are. Hackers is not a bad thing. Hackers is a third party augmentation thing. It's making a capability on the outside of your business. Harness capability on the inside of your business, and then that collective intelligence gives you something better. Because in today's world, it's not about building great products and services. People don't want great products and services. What they want are ecosystems. They want ecosystems of third-party augmentation. The iPhone is a great product, but it's better because of the things that we can do with it, even though we don't work for Apple. CNN is great, not because of CNN organically only, but CNN allows us to go in via CNN iReport. You can see, today it's not about being big and having a big skyscraper to compete. It's not about having a collaborative environment inside your organization or knowledge workers and all these modern day cultures. It's actually about being co-creative. Co-creativity is the sustainable business model moving forward. Why? Bill Joy said this, ex Microsoft Microsystems, he said there's always smarter people on the outside of your business. More of them, more capable than on the inside of your business. Sustainability now is about opening up your business so people can get in, and it's these people. Get the book, it's a great book. But let's celebrate some of the other hackers. I mean, we know Jobs and, and Wozniak. Um, there's some other hackers that are doing some really, really cool things, and we're seeing this. Uh, I think we're in a place right now, technologically, where GeoCities was in the middle 90s. Remember the mid 90s, there was this thing called GeoCities, or GeoCities. You could go to any great websites. Remember the guy on the internet with the little shovel, and it said, under construction? That gave birth to Amazon, that gave birth to Google, that was the origin of the internet as you know it today. I believe we're going into another second iteration of that today, and that, I think, is sensor embedding. What we see happening on the edges of the network is actually innovation, not on the inside of the network. Because we've got tool sets, we've got capabilities, we've got computers, we've got sensors in our pockets with enormous capability. And I'm going to allude to some of that today, because I don't think we're fully exploiting and leveraging it. So let's keep going. In fact, when I just go back there, this is one on Kickstarter right now where you can actually take your own uh, blood pressure yourself. Take a look at these kids. Hacking, little belt, putting Kinect in it, beagle board, some open source hardware, wrapping it around their waist, and he's got a little thing that he throws over his head and it's got vibration sensors in it. And it, essentially what they're trying to do is solve issues associated with blind people, where they don't need guide dogs, because as they walk, it just vibrates and it teaches them where to go. So external awareness, so using sensors, people embedding sensors, that's a phone embedded in a prosthetic. These are the people that you've got to watch. If you want to know what's going to be the next internet, if you want to know what the big next jump is, the big next jump is not what you see in front of you right now. This is all geocities. This is people having fun. I mean, Tim O'Reilly said it very, very well. He says, true innovation, organic invention, doesn't occur amongst entrepreneurs or even business people. It occurs when people are having fun. And you need to watch these folks. So take a look at it. Arduino. Right, open source hardware, Raspberry Pi computers. These are things that are getting embedded in things. And I think that's the future of the web. It's not the internet of things. I think it's the internet in things. I don't think it's you having a physically awesome experience with it. I think it's a functional engagement with it, which is a very different form of network. When you see folks flying, it's the ultimate hacker, right? He's hacking flight, just like these folks that are over there. Personal flight, augmenting your own body so you can fly. I mean, I love what he says at the bottom, we just don't have time for it, but it's amazing that we've got some of these hackers around. People in New York using bike, bicycle share. There's this thing where you get a bike and you can ride it if you pay the city X amount a month. Um, and hackers are hacking the bicycle share spots, but they're putting little Arduino sensors on there. So, you know, this is in an apartment in Brooklyn, New York, and they're using Arduino sensors on all the bicycle share points. And before you leave, you know which bicycle share point has bicycles. Right? It's simple. It doesn't mean anything. It doesn't have a beautiful screen but it's hacking. People are taking inanimate objects and they're embedding things inside of them, right? Putting USB sticks inside of walls. We have this, this urge to, to, to make things speak, to make things store things. And inanimate objects are starting to speak. They're starting to declare their senses. And today I want to call to arms in terms of the hackers that are out there and say, let's make things more sensory aware. Don't worry about data types. Don't worry about XML. Don't worry about all those things. Let's embed more sensors because sensors give us presence. And presence is the one thing that's missing in artificial intelligence today. We don't need better AI algorithms. What we need is more data. 
The Google car, the autonomous driving vehicle, doesn't have better algorithms. It's got data. So I think what we need to do is take a look at where we are today with cloud computing. Let me talk about that for a second, because everyone talks about cloud computing. I think we should stop talking about phones and we should stop talking about cloud computing, because they are not phones. Stop calling them phones, because those things in your hands are not phones. What they are, are sense to be real-time peripheral ranging engines. Right? The future is not you looking constantly through a glowing rectangle at things. It's not pointing stuff at stuff and then seeing things happen. That's not the future. The future is when the things that you are looking at has embedded intelligence and sensory awareness inside it. Right? And all you have on you is the sensory aware rendering it. Right? We should stop calling it cloud computing. I've got a slide that's coming up now. The guys kind of juggled me up. But the slide is going to talk about not cloud computing, but Smurfs. Yeah. I think the next generation network should be called Smurfs. Okay. Okay, I'll get to that in a sec. These are the hackers that we've seen you know, in history, some famous, famous hackers. And I, I think these are the very same people that we have today, just having fun. So let's go into it. Humanity, where do we come from in terms of this? The first time we actually utilized technology was ourselves. We spoke, right? We used the larynxes, these things in our throats. We sat around local area networks called campfires. You know, the big hard drives with the gray hair disposed data to the younger hard drives and said, don't go there, don't do these things. Sounds and symbols, you know, generated data in it, inside of us. And that allowed us to survive. And then somebody went into a cave, took mud, put it in their mouth, put their hand against the cave wall and intentionally left a legacy. They spat on the cave wall. And from there, people wrote on cave walls and then writing, and writing changed us, right? This made us survive, that changed us. Why? Because it made us contemplative. We were never contemplative before. Books took ideas from somebody else in a medium that we went away with and we consumed it and we thought about it. You know, reading and writing, the reading itself was a square, 120, 130 years ago, it was something that happened in a square where the human modem sat with the data medium or the disk, the hard drive, the book, and communicated to the town in the square what was written on the book. It was fascinating. Um, a human being conveying thoughts of another human being to a group of people was fascinating. It switched on receptors and, and neurons and things that I had that we never used before. Now we've jumped from there to there. And that's a little snapshot of all this kind of synapses. The little spots on there are IP address ranges. And you can take a look at it. It looks like a little bit of a brain. This is an overused image. But that's us. That is a digital extension of the physical human nervous system. That's us going from where we went to and making this massive jump. And I call it humanity. It's not technology. When I sit down with executives, etc., I tell them as much as it is about technology today, it's actually more about humanity. You don't need to understand technology more. You need to understand its consequence more. When you understand its consequence more, then you kind of figure out what it means and where it's going. Because its consequence is allowing people to express their humanity. And I've got slides that will speak to this here in a second, like this one. What killed Kodak? What killed Kodak wasn't a competitor across the road. What killed Kodak wasn't a particular technology. This is a very weird question when you ask people this. Why did Kodak declare bankruptcy? A company of that size, with its worth. Why, in my opinion? Because they focused on making the camera more yellow, making the flash, flash better, underwater. That's not what people wanted. You know what people wanted? They wanted the ability to take a picture and save it onto a social media stream. And what they wanted was the like button to be clicked. Because the like button speaks to your humanity. You love it when people click on the like button because you feel a part of something. You have an hormonal change in your body when that happens because you feel recognized, you get attribution. That's why the web is more giving than it is taking. Streams of information right now, what is Twitter? Twitter is the stuff that we put into it. What is YouTube? It's the stuff that we put into it. What is Facebook? It's the stuff that we put into it. The most valuable companies in the world in aggregate today are not companies that make great things. It's companies that make things that allow us to express our humanity. Allow us to take the picture. We don't care about the quality. We don't care about the device per se, but just the mere capability to share speaks to who we are. And I think that's the new notion of what businesses need to understand because it's kind of like electricity. When we discovered electricity, we had no notion of what to do with electricity. The first time electricity was monetized wasn't people buying electricity. It was actually electricity. It was in fairs behind tents. You had electrical hackers that figured out how to generate or, or render Tesla's are. And people went into the back of tents and touched, and their hair raised up, and they paid a penny for that. Right? Because there was no electrical engineering degree, and then hackers took it into homes. You know what the next big iteration of electricity was in terms of its monetization? It was rich people sleeping with the lights on in New York. They hired hackers to generate electricity in their basements. Why? Affluency was depicted by ambiency. You step with the lights on, you have cash. 
It was a fashion symbol. And I see technology today, it's exactly there. It's the electricity in the basement. It's the beautiful iPad in my hand. It's the iPhone. You know, it's the Blackberry Z10. It's, it's all these different things that we have in our hand. They're fashion symbols, but that's not what they are. Something happened to electricity. It disappeared. And this is what we need to do with technology. We need to make it go away. Because in its going away, it becomes ubiquitous. In its going away, it has its effect that it was intended to have, which is to allow us to express our humanity. Electricity was about being focused. It was about it all the time. But when it finally had its impact on the Industrial Revolution, it was when people took a step back and not focused on what it was, but its consequence. And its consequence was only fully experienced and accepted when three things happened that went away. We created a wide area network, we put it, and we figured out how to convey this utility over vast distances. Then we created this thing called ACDC, a standard, to tether onto this wide area network. Then something happened that made it ubiquitous, not just in factories, was the permanent utilization. It was less about what it was, and it became a service that was ubiquitously available. Now electricity is in things, not just accessible in plugs in, in specific areas, it's in your laptop, it's in your phone, it's in your car. And I think that's where the web needs to go. That's where technology is going to go. So take a look at this. These things are like electricity. They're pretty, they're nice, they're beautiful. We have a one megapixel camera on the phone, then a five, then eight, then a 15, and then suddenly Nokia announces a 41 megapixel camera on the phone. Technology changes exponentially and evolves exponentially, not sequentially. We've got Apple that just announced, not the A7 chip, the 64, but Microsoft processor and the phone. That's interesting because it's a powerful device. What was more interesting was the M7 processor. Because what they did is they introduced an architecture focused on the sensors. So the gyroscope, the compass, the accelerometer on the phone now has a processor dedicated to it. It's more intelligent. It, know, it can render things more intelligently because the sensors are quarantined and cordoned off. Greater intelligence capability for sensors on the edge of the network. This architecture we're going to see spinning into more and more devices and more and more things as we move forward. So let me talk about the depth of visualization. Let's talk about the, where technology is going. When I say, let's make it die, I don't want to. We give people too much technology. We give people better bank branches to go into. We give them devices to, with cards. That's not how people want to pay. People want to walk in, take the brand muffin and the coffee, and walk out and get a notification that payment was made. People don't want to pay better. They don't want more technology to pay better. And this applies to every single industry. If you take a look at the, when you got lost, how did you first you know, move around when you got lost? Got, right? You took a map book out of a cubby hole and you opened up the map book and you said A7. And some of you, that's how you got here this morning. Right? This, is, this is where I need to go. Then what happened after that? A, 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 a beautiful visual engagement and render. This Garmin, Google Maps in the car. Beautiful. What's the next step thereafter? Better Google Maps? Better Garmin? Beauty, more beautiful? No. Really, it's the Google Autonomous Driving Vehicle. It's the embedding of geo invisibly in the object and experience relevantly, functionally. Right? It's the blind guy getting in the car saying, take me to Taco Bell. It's not a visual experience with it. Amazon.com, in my opinion, their success, yes, great AWS cloud services, etc. but the success was Jeff Bezos understood that people didn't want prettier shopping carts. What people actually wanted was the book. So he created one thing, and they patented one thing. So when you go buy the book, you one click and you get the book. Don't give people more technology, kill technology. The iPhone, the, the, I, the iPod, Sony had all the technology, all the buttons and all the equalizers and stuff, but Apple came along and took all of that stuff away and gave us a little scroll wheel with songs on it. And they overtook that. People don't want more tech, they want technology to understand who they are. Take a look at the sensors on the edges of the networks. They don't have screens, these sensors. Right, they're ubiquitous. These are, this is the Fitbit bracelet, this is the jawbone bracelet. They're incredible. They give you real-time analytics. They don't give you an electronic patient health record. They give you a real-time lifestyle, self-managed, ambient and perpetually updated record. And they don't have screens. It's machine-to-machine -machine engagement, not human-to-machine engagement. Machine-to-machine -to, -machine to human engagement. That's where we are. I'm not going to speak about that. I just want to conclude with this, on where cloud computing is going. Everyone's talking about cloud and it's irritating me. <laughs> So because even the way my engineers work, I have to keep bringing them back and say, stop thinking in this cloud way. Because cloud computing is, for me, operationalized disaster recovery. That's not what we should be doing. I think cloud computing is a lot more complex and a lot more valuable and a lot more capable than what we depicted. And this is what I want to call it, Smurfs. So every time someone today says cloud, get up and say Smurfs. Okay. And this is what I call it. It's a sensory membrane of ubiquitous real-time federated subsystems. 
right? And so Smurfs. What, what this is, think about it for a second. When you do a Google search on your phone, does anything happen on your phone? Nothing. Right? You do a Google search, you put Don in there. Don Packard. And what comes back is everything about Don. Pictures, images, videos, newspaper reports. Federated subsystems instantaneously rendered down to your device in a sensory way away. You put Google goggles on your phone. Let's stick to Google for a second. You put Google goggles up and you point it at something and it comes back with images that look like that. You point it at images of Don and people like Don pop up on the internet that look like Don. You put it pointed at me and pictures of Barack Obama pop up. <laughs> right. um, so the cloud can see. The cloud can know where you are. You put Google Voice, the old version, right? You pick up your iPhone, you say, Bryanston Pizza, you look at your phone, there's pizza shops in Bryanston. The, the cloud felt, the cloud heard and rendered information to you. You took, put up, there's little apps like, um, uh, there's a loca cab locator app in San Francisco, where you launch this app on your phone, I won't say the name, but you launch this app on the phone and you say, I want to go to Don's house in San Francisco. It reads where the cabs are all the time via the transportation feed from the city. You follow it, it changes the UI on your phone to green with an arrow. You follow the arrow, you follow the arrow, you follow. when you get to the curb where you need to stand, it goes amber, then it goes red, and as the taxi is coming closer, it starts vibrating, look at it, it says, pick me up, you pick it up and it whistles. Hells the cabin on your That's not cloud computing. That's rich, sensory aware computing. And my call to arms today is let's start focusing on the capabilities of the network. Let's start hacking and putting sensors in things. Because it's not about giving people more technology, it's about giving people a functional engagement. It's cloud in your hands, not cloud in the sky. Because what we have on the edge is incredible. And it's going to keep becoming more incredible because storage capacity on these devices are increasing. A 180 gig iPod can store 17 years of music, non-stop length. Right? The next iteration of that iPod will store one year of video. The next iteration now, after 24 months from now, will store uh, all music ever generated by mankind. The next one thereafter will store an entire snapshot of the internet as it is today on a single handheld device. The internet's going to change away from us having this client-server relationship. We're going to have an osmotic relationship with the internet. Today we have a pheromonic relationship. That's how data moves in a pheromonic way on the internet. I think it's going to be osmotic. You're going to have full snapshots in things and you'll pay for the subscription to yield, to stay updated to the latest stuff and with the real-time streams. So we're going to move away to an osmosis high saturation to low saturation form of engaging with the web. But my, again, my call to arms is kill the internet. So here's my, in closing, two rules that I want to put out there to the world, to the hackers in the room and all hackers out there and all businesses out there. In everything that you make, these are the two rules. Make it hackable, number one. Number two is create more value than you derive. Always derive less value than you create. Thank you so much this morning. Cheers.